Hello and welcome to the New Testament Daily with me, Jerry Dierman, where we read and talk through a chapter of the New Testament every single day. I'm glad you're here because reading God's Word daily will change your life. You can also help others find out about this resource and stay in the Word daily when you click like on this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, or share this link with others. So let's pray and then we'll jump into God's Word. Father, thank you so much for the precious, written, inspired, living Word of God. And I pray that by the Holy Spirit, each of us would hear exactly what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, here we go. Acts chapter 21, here's what it says. Now it came to pass when we had departed from them and set sail, running a straight course, we came to cause the following day to Rhodes and from there to Patera. And finding a ship sailing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had sighted Cyprus, this was an island, we passed it on the left, sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre, that's up on the coast, it's uh, just to the north of the land of Israel, right on the Mediterranean. So it says, For there the ship was to unload her cargo, and finding some disciples, we stayed there seven days. They told Paul, watch, through the Spirit, not to go up to Jerusalem. Now before we had seen that Paul said, in every city it's testified by the Holy Spirit that chains and tribulation await me. So in other words, the Holy Spirit, he didn't say, was saying, don't go, but just warning him that chains and tribulation await him. But this says here, very interesting, they told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. Now, are they saying the Holy Spirit said don't go? Or are they getting the same thing that Paul said, that chains and tribulation await, and they're picking that up from the Holy Spirit and therefore telling him, don't go because chains and tribulation await you, which was true. I think it's the latter. Verse 5, and I'll tell you why, because it seems as you go through the story of what happens that it doesn't have anything in the book of Acts or any other place in the New Testament that I found that give us an indication that Paul was missing it by going to Jerusalem. It seemed like the Lord wanted him to go. And Jesus even appears to him eventually and says, you will see Rome. It was the will of God that Paul make it to Rome, and he knew it. Verse 5, when we had come to the end of those days, we departed and went on our way. And they all accompanied us with wives and children till we were out of the city. And we knelt down on the shore and prayed. When we had taken our leave from one another, I just love the tenderness of the brethren when the Apostle Paul and his companions would come in. It was very tender and uh, they were very close, even though he wasn't there very often. When we had taken our leave of one another, we boarded the ship and they returned home. And when we had finished our voyage from Tyre, we came to Ptolemaeus, greeted the brethren and stayed with them one day. On the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea. And remember, Caesarea is the port on the Mediterranean closest to Jerusalem. And entered the house of Philip the evangelist. Well, where is Philip? He's in Caesarea. Now, why is Caesarea important to us? Well, not only is it the port that's closest to Jerusalem, but even more so, that's where Cornelius lived, who called for Peter, and Peter came and preached. And that's the first uh, place where the Holy Spirit fell on the Gentiles. And now Philip is obviously living in the city of Caesarea. And it says here, we entered the house of Philip the Evangelist. Well, this is the Philip that preached in Samaria and multitudes came uh, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Well, now he's living in Caesarea. It says, we entered the house of Philip the Evangelist Angelus, who was one of the seven, so that tells us from Acts chapter 6, he was one of those chosen, and stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. The New American Standard Bible translate that, translates that. Now this man had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. They were prophetesses. They prophesied the Word of God. Now this tells you right now, from the Bible, that God uses women to speak the Word of God, to speak prophetically by the Holy Spirit. 
And Philip had four that did this. So uh, don't say the Bible doesn't recognize women in ministry and ministering and ministering powerfully by the Holy Spirit. We've already seen Priscilla, and now we're seeing these four virgin daughters, prophetesses of Philip in Caesarea. So, verse 10, And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Well, was that a true prophecy? Yes, it was a true prophecy. Well, should Paul go to Jerusalem? If you say no, then this prophecy won't come to pass. If you say yes, it will come to pass. See, so it's evident that the Holy Spirit is not telling him not to go, but just once again warning him of what's going to happen when he, when, they, when he gets there. Remember that Jesus said in the 16th chapter of John, he said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he'll tell you things to come. That's exactly what he's doing. Thank God for the gifts of the Spirit, for prophecy, for words of wisdom and such. Verse 12, Now when we heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. <laughs> so I don't believe at all that the Holy Spirit is, not, is, is telling him not to go. But of course, you love Paul. You don't want chains and you don't want him to be turned over to the Gentiles, to the Romans. So they pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Do you see this hero? He's not going to be deterred. If this is what God has called me to do, even to die, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. May we all have that much commitment and selflessness to fulfill whatever assignment the Lord gives us. That's what Jesus did going to the cross. He became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross, that we might be saved. And Paul's saying that the emperor or whoever in Rome might be saved. I'll go. I'll go. So, verse 14. So when he would not be persuaded, Paul was a strong man, I mean, strong-willed. So when he would not be persuaded, we ceased, saying, the will of the Lord be done. So guess what they did? They finally conceded that it was indeed the will of God for him to go to Jerusalem. Verse 15, And after those days we packed and went up to Jerusalem. Why does it say went up to Jerusalem? It's an elevation thing, not a north-south thing. Caesarea is uh, generally about the same lat latitudinal line. So they're going from west on the coast of the Mediterranean east to Jerusalem. But the up is indicative of elevation. Verse 16, also some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us and brought with them a certain nascent of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we were to lodge. And when we had come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, that's James, the half-brother of Jesus, who was the primary leader, it appears, of the church in Jerusalem. And all the elders were present. When he had greeted them, he told in detail those things which God had done, giving them an update, uh, which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord. And they said to him, You see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law. But they have been informed about you, that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the customs, which, by the way, Paul was not doing. Paul was not trying to get Jews who believed in Jesus to stop circumcising their kids. He was just against everybody telling the Gentiles that they have to be circumcised to be saved, see, and keep the law. Verse 22. So they're telling Paul now, hey, all these Jewish believers have heard about you, that you're commanding people, commanding Jewish people not to keep the law. So they want to resolve that uh, misconception about Paul. Verse 22, what then? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. Therefore, 
do what we tell you. We have four, we have four men here who will take a vow. Take them and be purified with them. Pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and that all may know that those things of which we were informed concerning you are nothing, but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. So they're giving him something to do to help these men to make a vow to do things according to the law so that everybody can see, oh, look, he's not abandoning the law or coercing people, influencing Jewish people to not keep the law anymore. In fact, he's keeping the law. Verse 25, but concerning the Gentiles who believe, we have written and decided that they should observe no such thing except that they should keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. Then Paul, so Paul went along with this, then Paul took the men, and the next day, having been purified with them, entered the temple to announce the expiration of the days of purification, at which time an offering should be made for each one of them. Now, when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, now from Asia, what does that mean? Up there in Asia Minor, up in what we know as modern day Turkey, well, that's where Paul was ministering. That's where Ephesus and such is. It says, but they came down for the feast. Remember, Paul was coming for a feast. The Jewish people would come from all over to the feast at Jerusalem. So it says, when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, men of Israel, help. This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law, and this place, talking about the temple. And furthermore, he also brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. Well, that wasn't true, but they presumed that that happened. And here's the parenthetical statement. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. Verse 30, and all the city was disturbed and the people ran together, seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple and immediately the doors were shut. Now as they were seeking to kill him, news came to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the commander, the soldiers, listen, and when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. How long had they been beating him? And when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating him. They had dragged him out of the temple, shut the doors, and then finally word gets back to the commander. He rallies his troops, and he's got to make his way through the crowds of Jewish people at this feast to get down there, and finally, when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. It seems that they have been beating him for quite some time. Then, they, uh, then the commander came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains. And he asked who he was and what he had done. And some among the multitude cried one thing and some another. So when he could not ascertain the truth because of the tumult, he commanded him to be taken into the barracks. And when he reached the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. For the multitude of the people followed, by the way, this, this almost exclusively, if not completely, Jewish people. Jewish people, but non-believing Jews. Or, who knows, it could have even been some believing Jews who felt like Paul was turning Jewish believers against the law. So it says, for the multitude of the people followed after, crying out, away with him. Now, likely these are non-believing Jews, Jews who don't believe that Jesus is the Christ. Verse 37, then as Paul was about to be led into the barracks, he said to the commander, may I speak to you? He replied, can you speak Greek? Are you not the Egyptians? He didn't have any idea who this guy is. Are you not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a rebellion and led the 4,000 Assyrians out into the wilderness, but Paul said, I am a Jew from Tarsus, from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city, and I implore you, permit me to speak to the people. So when he had given him permission, Paul stood on the stairs and motioned with his hand to the people. 
And then when there was a great silence, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language saying, and that's the end of the chapter. This is one of the strangest chapter breaks, but Paul's going to start talking in chapter 22. And guess what? We'll get to that tomorrow. And it's a really powerful thing and kind of a sad thing that ends up happening. But you'll have to wait until tomorrow until we get to it, unless you want to just read ahead and find out what's going on. But don't miss it. We'll talk about it tomorrow. Thank God for the confidence, the boldness of the Apostle Paul and willing to be beat and to come to this place. He knew it was going to happen and he endures it. And guess what? Instead of just saying, get me out of here, the mob, the mob is about to kill me. He asked the commander, hey, let me speak to the people. Let me reason with them. Can you believe this guy? Just get out of there, Paul. Nope. No, I want him to know the truth. Let me speak to him. <laughs> He's amazing. May we all have, have this kind of love for people that we're willing to endure whatever it takes to bring the truth to them. God bless you. I'll see you tomorrow.